uh, this lecture is on the peripheral nervous system. And this is just going to provide an overview of the structure of the peripheral nervous system and uh, the damage that can occur. So we'll go over the three different types of damage, whether you're damaging the myelin sheath, uh, the axons within nerves, or the nerve itself. And I'll highlight just a couple of different neuropathies. Uh, we're going to go over damage to the peripheral nervous system in the next two lectures. But the peripheral nervous system is going to connect our central nervous system, that be the brain and spinal cord, uh, with the rest of our body. Uh, you can see an image of the central and peripheral nervous system here. So the brain and, and spinal cord are going to house the majority of our neurons. And then the peripheral nervous system is going to have a few cell bodies scattered throughout the body. Uh, in what we call ganglia, but for the most part we should think of the peripheral nervous system as a collection of nerve fibers, so it's mostly axons. They're going to connect those uh, neurons within the central nervous system or very close to it with the rest of the body. So with the muscles to allow movement, uh, with the skin, muscle, and joints to allow us to feel uh, position of our body and, and any sort of sensory input that's occurring. They'll also innervate the viscera and various glands throughout the body um, and that'll be through the autonomic nervous system. So all those nerve fibers that we find outside of the brain and spinal cord, that's your peripheral nervous system. <clears throat> now for the most part what we're talking about are spinal nerves. Um, cranial nerves are, are going to innervate head structures and the spinal nerves will get a little bit of the head. Uh, which we covered in our, our headache lecture. Um, but the spinal nerves are going to hit all the rest of the body. Cranial nerves will mostly deal with the head. Um, the major exception there would be the vagus, which is going to hit uh, uh, also the, the, the throat, which I guess would be the head, uh, but also the heart, your GI tract. So it's going to go and hit other structures besides the head. The cranial nerves are kind of a mixed bag, though. Some of them we don't think of as being a part of the peripheral nervous system, uh, like the olfactory nerve. So cranial nerves one and two we think of as being central. Uh, this has to deal with their source. Uh, for example, the olfactory nerve is derived from uh, progenitor cells within the central nervous system, and we have to constantly regenerate it because that first cranial nerve uh, is going to pass through the uh, cribriform plate there, so we have our olfactory bulbs, here's your, your nasal cavity there. Uh, so whenever you smell in something, there's actually dendrites dangling within a, a layer of mucus there. But those dendrites are exposed to the air, and so these neurons will die off as a result, and we'll have to constantly regenerate them. Um, and so we have some progenitor cells within the central nervous system that constantly regenerate this very short first cranial nerve. The second cranial nerve um, is going to run from the retina back into the thalamus as well as other targets. That's myelinated by oligodendrocytes so clearly that puts it in the central nervous system. All the other cranial nerves we think of as being a part of the peripheral nervous system so what we're saying here today is true and applies to them, but we're going to focus on spinal nerves because those are very clearly a uh, pure peripheral nervous system. Uh, sort of. <clears throat> of course, the motor neurons are going to live within the central nervous system, but all the action happens out there in the periphery at the neuromuscular junction. So we can see the dermatomes uh, here in this image. Um, you can see parts of the head that are innervated by different cranial nerves, but then we also have our cervical, thoracic, lumbar, uh, sacral, and coccygeal uh, targets there. Uh, and you can see it's just an orderly arrangement going from cervical all the way down into our uh, sacral spinal cord there. We're going from the top basically to the bottom. What you have to think of, rather, because we're bipeds, it's a little weird. Uh, but if we weren't, if humans uh, were four-legged, then this would make total sense. It would be a uh, head-to-toe arrangement as we move down the spinal cord. But because we're standing up, what it's going to do is give the appearance of kind of wrapping around our legs and then ending at the anus. But the anus should be at the end of the body if we're four-legged. So that's why your, your dermatomes you see are going to wrap around. So if you look at the, 
uh, the, the back view there, you get a pretty decent view of where the sacral uh, and coccygeal uh, segments are going to innervate. So it's going to be the, really the backs of the legs, uh, the butt cheeks, and, and the, the butt hole there. <laughs> There's probably a nicer way to say that. So the arrangement does make sense uh, for uh, four-legged animals, but we defy that uh, because we walk on two legs. There's still a nice orderly arrangement here. And the uh, spinal nerves are, are going to carry out uh, really both uh, sensory and motor functions. Uh, the sensory uh, organization makes sense. The motor organization also makes sense, again, from head to toe. So the higher levels of the spinal cord control higher levels of the body. Uh, and here you can just see that uh, different movements are going to be uh, carried out by different segments of the spinal cord. So the shoulder is going to be innervated by multiple segments. All right, so the upward and downward movements, those are going to be carried out by different spinal nerves. But they're all going to hit the same um, uh, segment and, and still the arrangement makes sense, right? Uh, C5 to 7, as you move a little further down to the elbow, we'll still get uh, C5, uh, but now we're including C8, right? Once you get down into your fingers, uh, here we're going to actually get rid of those kind of upper middle cervical regions. Now we're purely lower cervical spine, maybe a little bit of thoracic as well. Thoracic is going to get down here. Lumbar is going to hit your legs, higher up on the leg, higher up in lumbar, lower in the leg, lower lumbar. Those spinal nerves uh, that are innervating our body are going to be a mixture of sensory and motor components. Once you make it into an actual peripheral nerve, it's always mixed. You have a mixture of sensory, motor, conscious, and autonomic. Everything is mixed in there together within the same nerve. So we have the um, afferents, or afferents. Some folks like to emphasize the A. And uh, efferents. Afferents arrive and efferents exit. So sensory is going to arrive into the spinal cord there. They're going to live right outside in the dorsal root ganglia. So they're not within the spinal cord itself, but they're very, very close to it in the dorsal root ganglia. So it's on the dorsal side. It looks like a little root, and it's a collection of cell bodies. That would be the ganglia part of it. Of course, the motor neurons are going to live in your anterior or ventral horns. Same thing. Here we have some inner neurons. These are going to be more sensory neurons, uh, but these will be secondary. Your primary sensory neurons are going to live out here, out here in the dorsal root ganglia, and that's where we'll have our sensory neurons. Some might innervate locally if they're small and unmyelinated. The larger myelinated axons are going to form those posterior columns and just head on up there. There's also some reflexes that they form too. But when we look away from the spine, these are going to mix together. So the motor components are also going to form a ventral root, and these are going to fuse. They're only separated in the central nervous system. All right, so let's take a trip outside there. Once you exit the spinal column, so in the dorsal and ventral roots come together to exit the spine. They pass through that uh, intervertebral foramen there, so the hole between the, the vertebra, and here's where they form their spinal nerve. So now we're a mixed spinal nerve. We got our dorsal root and we got our ventral root. This is the spinal cord. And then this will be our uh, not anatomically correct spinal column so we can fit the letters in. But we have vertebrae that wrap around and surround the spinal cord since it's part of the central nervous system. Coming off of that we have <coughs> mixed fibers here. Uh, some of them are going to be sensory, some will be motor uh, as you can see in this cartoon. Now where they exit is going to be those spaces between the vertebrae there. These are kind of uh, smaller sites and compression can occur here. We're going to talk about compression in the next lecture though. So we got motor, ventral, sensory, dorsal, and everything's collected together in those uh, peripheral nerves. <clears throat> so whenever we 
exit that intervertebral foramen. Uh, we have a couple of splits that can occur. So we're going to form little branches uh, called uh, rami here. There's a small offshoot that's going to come off and innervate the meninges. So that meningeal branch uh, is going to be responsible for giving us back pain. Um, so we innervate to see whether there's any sort of inflammation or compression going on at the level of the spine. So we have a small offshoot there where we have pain sensation. Uh, if we're in the thoracic and upper lumbar spine where we have uh, the sympathetic chain ganglia running by, then we're going to form a couple of rami here to hit our sympathetic chain ganglia. Sympathetic chain ganglia. So <clears throat> the, these are what we call the communicating rami because they're going to communicate uh, between the peripheral nerve to the sympathetic chain ganglia. So we're going to go from our preganglionic fibers to our postganglionic fibers. So the preganglionic come in, the sympathetic chain ganglia houses our postganglionic neurons, so they form a synapse. Then that postganglionic fiber comes out. The pre are myelinated, so these would be the white rami, and then the gray unmyelinated postganglionic fibers come off and rejoin that spinal nerve. Now this is only true in the uh, thoracic and then upper lumbar regions where we have the sympathetic chain ganglia. In other regions where we don't have sympathetic innervation to reach, these communicating rami don't uh, exist. But it is always the case that we're going to split off and form dorsal and ventral. Not a chance on that one. Not a chance. You get it. Ventral. So, uh, dorsal and ventral rami then are going to innervate different parts of the body. The ventral will hit the front, and will also hit the limbs. The dorsal components are going to hit the dorsal part of the body, and then the viscera, so your, your guts. <clears throat> so we'll hit the front, we'll hit the back. Uh, in general, your, your ventral rami are going to be a little bit bigger uh, because there's a lot more nerves dedicated to controlling our limbs. Uh, so in this illustration here, we're seeing the communicating rami. So we have in the kind of intermediate or lateral horns, those preganglionic sympathetic neurons, they'll head on out the ventral root, they'll pass through the intervertebral foramen, and then they'll form the white ramus here, synapse with the postganglionic neuron within the sympathetic uh, chain ganglia, those postganglionic uh, neurons then project their axon back via the gray ramus back into the spinal nerve, and there we now have gone from pre to postganglion. Then after that, we split apart, we form dorsal uh, and, and ventral rami, and they're going to hit different parts of the body. Now, if we were to look at the um, a, a cross section of a peripheral nerve, we'll see that there's a few different uh, types of tissues within it. So we talked about meninges earlier on in the class and we have a continuation of the meninges here. So uh, hopefully we remember the dura mater, that'd be the, the, the tough mother. That's the tough outer covering uh, of the central nervous system. The dura mater forms the epineurium of peripheral nerves. So this is their tough mother. <clears throat> This is a direct continuation, so the dura mater that surrounds the spinal cord uh, continues to wrap around those nerves that come off. So here's our spinal cord here, and we're going to create 
uh, nerves at different segments. The dura mater is going to continue along those spinal nerves and form the epineurium. So if you were to do a cross section here, let's say here's a spinal nerve, the outside is that layer of tough skin. So this is filled with a lot of collagen, making it very resistant uh, to tearing and stretching. That's its job. So the epineurium is going to be on the outside and it's tough. This is all about physical uh, protection, preventing that nerve from, from stretching. Within there, we're going to have bundles of axons called fascicles. And they come in different sizes, just like the axons within them. Some will be smaller, some will be much larger. They don't have to be perfect circles. Surrounding the fascicles, this is where we have our perineurium. So there's three different types of um, uh, tissues in here that we're going to talk about that, that form the mesoneurium. So these are kind of like the meninges of spinal nerves. The perineurium is going to surround fascicles, the bundles of axons, and also some blood vessels as well. Because you got to have blood if you're going to keep your axons alive. The perineurium is going to form what we call the nerve tissue barrier, where the nerve fibers, I'm sorry, the axons within these fascicles are protected against potential uh, toxins that are floating around out here. So any harmful substance can't really diffuse in where you have intact perineurium. There are places where the perineurium doesn't uh, quite have as tight of junctions, and these are sites where infection can occur. So um, along the majority of the nerve length, we're going to have a perineurium that's filled with tight junctions. And these tight junctions are going to be connections between cells that are so tight, things can't diffuse into them and affect the nerves. Now, within the perineurium here, we have our axons, we have blood vessels, and then we also have this support structure called the endoneurium. So within the fascicles, we have our endoneurium. This is going to surround axons, uh, blood vessels, and the, the glia that are there as well. And within the fascicles, let's go ahead and, and have a look here. Within Here's a fascicle. So there's axons of varying sizes. The larger ones will be myelinated, the smaller ones not so much. We also have blood vessels, and I'll draw it this way because I want to highlight the tight junctions that also exist here. This is going to form your blood nerve barrier so that the red blood cells and potentially any of the toxins that are floating around in the blood vessels uh, within the fascicle can't diffuse out and kill your nerves. So we have the blood-brain barrier and the, the blood-CSF barrier in the central nervous system. Out there in the peripheral nervous system, we have our blood-nerve barrier at the perineurium. And then within the fascicles, we have our uh, uh, blood-nerve barrier. Nerve tissue barrier, I should have said first. The perineurium has the uh, uh, nerve tissue barrier, so protecting the nerves and the rest of the tissue. And the blood nerve barrier is going to be within fascicles, tight junctions uh, between the uh, endothelial vasculature. So three types of tissues within there. And if you look at a real cross section uh, of a spinal nerve, you're going to see uh, some capillaries. So you got your blood vessels. Those are much larger uh, than the axons there. And they've, they've gone, gone ahead and labeled them for you. Here, uh, we're looking at a fascicle. So we've got our epineurium kind of surrounding everything, and then there'll be blood vessels here too, and the, so the epineurium is out here kind of filling the space up. And we have our fascicles. We have our then perineurium here. So you can see they're showing you one fascicle here, so it's surrounded by perineurium, and then the rest of the illustration is, is filled up with uh, epineurium. 
you'll see uh, axons of different sizes. Uh, they're showing you some that are myelinated, some that aren't. They highlight the myelin sheath in some cases. So you see different size axons. Uh, and that's because we have a mixture of uh, motor and sensory fibers, and those sensory fibers uh, can be large diameter or smaller diameter. And the same thing is true for motor fibers as well. So you have the smaller uh, unmyelinated uh, autonomic fibers as well as the large myelinated um, somatic motor fibers that allow us to have conscious control over our muscles. We have four general classes of um, nerve fibers and they get different names. It could be group one, two, three, or four. Um, a alpha, A beta, A delta, and C. That's another way of having four different group names. Either way, they're all telling you the same thing. The largest ones are going to be your motor axons. And they have the highest conduction velocity for two reasons. They have a, um, a, a greater diameter, and that decreases their internal resistance, so current flows uh, more rapidly. They also are myelinated, and that helps a lot. So those, those first three up there, all your A fibers, or groups one through three, those are all going to be myelinated. And as you go uh, from top to bottom, you'll see that the axon diameter decreases, so the resistance increases and current moves more slowly. So the conduction velocity drops. I want you to uh, look at the difference between your group two and your groups three and four. Group two is going to carry non-painful sensation. Groups three and four are going to carry painful sensation. You'll notice they're a little bit slower. And there's two different types. There's the myelinated type that will give you that first pain. And then there's the non-myelinated um, C fibers that give you the very long-lived pain. And it's very long-lived because they conduct slowly, but also because of the axon reflex uh, that's going to prolong their activation. So all the stuff we talked about um, with pain and headache still holds true here. But uh, the, the main point here is that we have different diameter um, axons, and we have a mixture of myelinated and non-myelinated fibers, and as a result, we have a mixture of conduction velocities. The fastest axons are going to be those involved in motor output so that we can quickly, um, let's say, remove ourselves from pain. Then we have non-painful sensation and the slower but more long-lived painful sensation. And that's to help make pain stick around a bit longer and make it a little more educational for us so that we learn from it. So there's the basics of the structure of uh, spinal nerves. So how they come off the spinal cord, some of the communicating um, the rami that are there, how they split into dorsal and ventral rami. There's still a mixture of sensory and motor axons, uh, and so you're going to see a variety of axon diameters. We have some protective barriers to keep them from getting injured, but sometimes injuries occur. Um, and when we have damage to our peripheral nerves, uh, we have peripheral neuropathies. And there are many ways that we can damage our peripheral nerves. Now first, uh, I want to make sure we know the three different categories of injury because there's a few different things that we could damage here. So let's think about all the stuff within our spinal nerves. Right? We have the mesoneurium, so the epineurium, perineurium, endoneurium. <clears throat> Within the perineurium, we have bundles of axons. So here's our axon. Now, of course, some of these are going to be myelinated. And of course, in those myelinated regions, we don't have any ion channels. All the ion channels are going to be found at nodes. That means if we lose our myelin, we're going to have an area where we have no ion channels. That means that this area uh, has no conduction. So if we lose the myelin sheath, which is what happens in uh, neuropraxia, we're going to have uh, a transient inability to conduct signals. So we're going to see some kind of weakness or uh, paresthesia occurring. But you should expect full recovery because the axon is intact. Um, the overlying uh, mesoneurium is intact, so the endoneurium, which is going to be most close to this, 
the fascicles are all going to be in place because the perineurium uh, is still intact. So whenever we have demyelination, and that's it, if everything else is intact, then we call uh, that neuropraxia. And this is going to be short-lived with complete recovery because the underlying axon is fine. We just simply have to wait for remyelination or the insertion of ion channels. And this is going to take uh, weeks to months. The next level of injury would be if we actually have damage to the axon. So if we have prolonged, uh, let's say, compression of a nerve, or uh, a little more pronounced um, uh, disruption of blood loss, for example. So if we take the injury to the next level, Rather than just having a very, let's say, transient uh, compression that causes demyelination, a little more prolonged compression um, can actually lead to the loss of the axon. So if we lose the axon in this case, obviously we're not going to be able to conduct signals uh, to and from the periphery. So we're going to again have uh, motor and sensory impairments. Uh, the recovery is going to be more uh, time-consuming though, so it's going to take much longer for recovery to take place, but we should expect full or at least close to full uh, recovery if we have our mesoneurium in place. So with accident mesis here, it's going to be axon loss. This would be terrible in the central nervous system. In the peripheral nervous system, though, we can recover. So um, that's because the myelinating glia here, the Schwann cells, actually promote axon regrowth, whereas oligodendrocytes prevent it. Uh, you don't want to go rewiring your brain, but if you have nerve damage, then it's okay to regrow that axon. We have a very linear path uh, from spinal cord to your peripheral tissues. So it's much easier to retrace that than to try to retrace a very complicated and convoluted path that exists in the brain. So we don't allow axon regrowth in the, in the central nervous system, but we do in the periphery. And that's why you can get recovery from um, accident mesis. And you should expect pretty darn good recovery because the mesoneurium is in place. And this is going to act as a guide. Because we just have to go to our one target. That's it. We're not doing any sort of complicated uh, network formation or anything like that that we do in the brain. It's very simple, linear, A to B. Spinal cord to muscle, or skin to spinal cord, whatever it may be. So we can retrace that as long as our mesoneurium is in place. When we have more pronounced damage, let's say we have a laceration or something that actually severs the entire nerve, and now we've lost our mesoneurium as well. This would be damage to the entire nerve, neuromesis. So in this case, we've lost the myelinating glia, we've lost the axons, and we've lost that connective tissue that holds the whole thing together. So we don't have a road anymore. You can repair this uh, surgically. It's not perfect by any means uh, because axons are going to jump back and forth between different fascicles, so you hope you align them pretty well, but you never know. So the nerves might not actually have the right road to retrace. So you can get recovery, um, but you should expect it to not be full. You should expect partial recovery in this case. The axons uh, can still regrow, but they just might not have the right path to get there. Um, so there's your three levels. Neuropraxia demyelination. Uh, this sucks, but you'll recover completely. Accident mesis, the second level there. Now we have loss of the axon. This sucks. It's going to take a little bit longer, but it's nowhere near as bad as neuromesis, where you actually sever the nerve, and recovery is going to be difficult at best. So in neuropraxia, we have not damaged the axon, and as a result, it's, it's still able uh, to conduct 
uh, electrical signals down it if you were to stimulate it. So these are uh, data recorded from the muscle, so they're recording compound action potentials in the muscle. <clears throat> You're looking at two different dates. So there's uh, the day of injury, that's going to be day one, and then there's nine days later at day ten. So when they do a, a, a kind of a, a small crush injury to cause uh, neuropraxia, that's your top two recordings there. And then if it's axonotmesis or neurotmesis, so a little more pronounced injury, that's on the bottom. So uh, S1 and S2 are different segments of the nerve. So what they're going to do is stimulate different segments of the nerve, either uh, before or after the site of injury. And what they're going to do then is record on the muscle and see what are we getting. So if we stimulate here, distal to the injury, that's what S1 is showing us. And whether it's day 1 or day 10, that axon is still there with uh, neuropraxia. And that's why recovery is uh, so much easier because all you have to do is recreate glia. And, and those are cells that are kind of designed to take some damage and reproduce again. It'll take time, but you will get recovery. So you see day one, uh, uh, day 10, that nerve is still there. Now when they're stimulating at S2 here, so uh, more proximal to the injury, whenever we stimulate an action potential here, once it hits that side of demyelination, then there's nothing. Then it won't communicate with the muscle. We don't see a compound action potential. And you can see it still hasn't recovered after day 10. So we're going to need some weeks here. Compare this then uh, to whenever we have loss of the axon. So uh, axonomesis or neuromesis. Whenever we actually lose the axon, uh, right at that day of injury, the axon is still there. What we've done is just sever it. So when they stimulate, they still get the compound action potential. But 10 days later, what's happened is anterograde degeneration of that axon. So since it's severed and it can't produce any more proteins, because that's all happening up here at the cell body, remember that. Since that cell body, sorry, this is a motor neuron, I, I can't stand that. It's not pseudo unipolar, it should be multipolar. We can't make proteins here. Since the axon is severed, we can't put any more proteins there. Without proteins, you're not long for this world. So we get anterograde degeneration. And that's why you'll see on day 10, no more compound action potential whenever they stimulate at segment 1. And that's because there's no axons there. That's all this is showing us, uh, is that regardless of uh, the mechanism of injury, you're going to have difficulties uh, uh, conducting your action potential down the axon, whether you, you, whether you lose the myelination or the axon itself. But what differs is how well are we going to recover? Uh, because if we lose that axon, we have to regrow it. We can more easily do that whenever the uh, mesoneurium is still intact. And you might have some chance of it uh, with neuromesis. But you don't have to regrow anything with neuropraxia where you just have focal demyelination. And that makes recovery much more likely. So short-lived compression uh, is going to be much better than long-lived compression or crush injuries as a result. Now there's a lot of different axons out there and they come uh, not only in variable diameters but also variable lengths. And that's going to um, affect how susceptible they are to damage. Because the longer the axon, um, the the larger an area you have for possible injury, but also the more ATP you're spending and the more prone you are to death in the first place. So whenever we see neuropathy, we tend to see more of a glove and stocking distribution because those are the longest axons and they're more easily killed off as a result. Um, whenever we see neuropathies, we will characterize them in terms of the number uh, and also the location of injury. So a mononeuropathy involves just simply one nerve. Uh, if it's very distal, you'll have a very small area that's affected. On the other hand, uh, if it's a little closer to the spinal cord uh, and is actually hitting a nerve root, we would call it a radiculo uh, neuropathy. 
and that's because it's going to radiate out from the spinal cord all the way down to the more distal parts of that nerve's uh, territory that it innervates. You can have uh, mononeuropathy, you can also have polyneuropathy where you're going to affect several nerves, and of course you can have uh, polyradiculitis where you affect several nerve roots. So if we're affecting the nerve itself, we won't see that radiating um, uh, distribution of sensory and motor loss. It'll be more focal and it'll tend to hit the distal parts, so glove and stocking. When we hit a nerve root, it's going to have to radiate out uh, all the way from uh, the, the spine to the distal uh, portions that are innervated by that nerve. When you have a single nerve affected, you're going to have really a single dermatome um, or a single band that's affected. And whenever you have multiple nerves affected, then you're just going to see um, additional dermatomes uh, included or additional areas affected. So rather than just a small part of the hand, you might have the entirety of the hand. Now, multiple nerves innervate the hand, so that means you must have a polyneuropathy if the entire hand is affected. So you can tell uh, based on the distribution of symptoms whether they be very focal or a little more distributed and whether they are in the distal portions or whether they radiate out, whether we're affecting one, two nerves, and whether we're affecting the nerve root or the nerve itself. All right, I'm gonna highlight just a couple of ways that we can get neuropathies and then we'll, we'll get those in the remaining lectures. So toxins uh, can cause neuropathies because neurons are pretty delicate cells. And that's why we have those uh, nerve tissue barriers and the blood nerve barriers because neurons are so delicate, it's pretty easy to kill them. You know, they're, they're highly excitable cells, so they're made to, to be excited, but that excitation can kill them. So they're, they're walking a very fine line here uh, between function and death. Um, two toxins to go over here. Uh, so lead is a neurotoxin uh, that can uh, lead to uh, um, wrist drop. So it tends to affect the upper limbs and again, kind of a little more distal portions, but we're going to see pretty pronounced neuropathy here. Um, so we'll have a look at the, the movie here. This is just going to show you um, what, what you see with lead poisoning. So that wrist drop. Here the extensor muscles are, are weak as are the flexors, but because of how the, the tendons are arranged, I guess it causes wrist drop. I don't know anything about tendons. But you can see here clear signs of weakness. And now when they're testing the reflexes, those aren't going to work because uh, the sensory fibers aren't going to work as well. The muscle fibers aren't working. So we're going to have weakness, uh, impaired sensation, impaired reflexes. Uh, and that's because lead is going to increase the production of free radicals that can lead to oxidative damage and kill off neurons, as we've talked about before. It can also inhibit voltage-gated calcium channels. So here you can see some of the motor weakness uh, again. Those voltage-gated calcium channels are, um, are critical for the release of neurotransmitters. So if we don't bring in calcium, we don't spit out neurotransmitter. And if we don't spit out neurotransmitter, we don't communicate either with muscle or with the spinal cord to provide that sensory feedback. And what these data are showing us here is the inhibition of voltage-gated calcium channels with different doses of lead. So the filled circles are showing you control. The open circles are showing you with lead. And what they're doing is uh, expressing these voltage-gated calcium channels in uh, a, a, a cell line that will uh, grow forever. So this is uh, a commonly used cell line called PC12 cells. So they take a little cell here uh, and they express calcium channels in it. So here's our voltage-gated calcium channel. Now you'll notice it's voltage-gated. That means we have to first depolarize for them to open up. So whenever we have an active potential, we depolarize. That's going to open the calcium channels. Calcium rushes in, we spit out neurotransmitter. So they stick these in the PC12 cells, and then they just simply depolarize them. That's what's happening on the x-axis. So we're obviously screaming about T-Rexes over there somewhere, but over here, uh, we're uh, going to adjust our membrane potential. We're going to go from negative, so basically rest, on upward. And when you do that, your calcium channels are going to open up, 
and you're going to get a measurable in word current, so an influx of calcium. <laughs> and, uh, whenever you apply different doses of lead, that inward current is going to be blunted. And so what that means is less calcium. With less calcium, you're going to spit out fewer neurotransmitters. So the ability to communicate synapse is impaired. The treatment here is just to chelate that lead with a little EDTA uh, before it kills off the neurons. So the inhibition of voltage-gated calcium channels is uh, most likely going to lead to the immediate effects of lead poisoning, but that uh, increased production of free radicals is going to then eventually kill off the nerves if we don't get the lead out. I think that's a saying. Um, organophosphates are commonly used um, insecticides that can also uh, be deadly neurotoxins. So what they're going to do is inhibit cholinesterase. All right, cholinesterase is an enzyme that's going to break down acetylcholine. That's its job. So all the movements that we, we carry out is going to be because of the release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. We want these to be brief. Uh, when we execute a movement and we stop it, we want to stop. We don't want to continue to contract. Um, and that's what uh, cholinesterase is going to do for us. So here's our motor axon. Of course, we know it's a presynaptic site because we're drawing these vesicles on it. So this is filled with acetylcholine. When they fuse with the membrane, they spit out acetylcholine. Um, on the postsynaptic side of things, we're going to have these postjunctional folds uh, on the muscle, and these are just going to help hold the acetylcholine for a little bit before it tries to leak out of the synapse where it encounters cholinesterase. Cholinesterase is going to break down acetylcholine into an acetate and choline. And what our organophosphates are going to do is inhibit cholinesterase function. So we don't break down acetylcholine. That means that acetylcholine levels build up in the synapse. Immediately this is going to lead to uh, contraction of the muscles. So you'll get some kind of twitching going on. But then very quickly uh, the postsynaptic receptors here that are lining the postsynaptic site. So all along here we have a whole bunch of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. These are the ion channels that acetylcholine binds to and allows for depolarization of the muscle. That's what all this crap is. When the muscle depolarizes, it fires an action potential, contracts. So, by inhibiting cholinesterase, acetylcholine builds up, you get that Contraction followed by paralysis, and that's because of desensitization of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So they stop depolarizing the muscle. With prolonged stimulation, acetylcholine receptors have a built-in break. So what they're going to do is inhibit themselves, and that's what we call desensitization. So when they desensitize, we flood them, we flooded them with too much acetylcholine, so it doesn't really matter what's out there they're not going to depolarize the muscle anymore, so this leads to paralysis. Uh, this can be um, life-threatening, of course, whenever we paralyze the muscles involved with respiration. Uh, we, we also affect the autonomic nervous system, particularly the parasympathetic nervous system, because it uses acetylcholine. So what you're going to get are dangerous drops in blood pressure uh, because of uh, vasodilation in the gut. Uh, you're also going to get some uh, bradycardia, uh, you'll get uh, 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 pupillary uh, dilation, I'm sorry, constriction. Uh, you'll get salivation, uh, there will be lacrimation, uh, vomiting, urination, uh, defecation. Uh, basically everything that the parasympathetic nervous system accomplishes, you're going to see that uh, very robustly. The treatment here uh, would be with atropine um, and cholinesterase activators, so something to turn back on this enzyme. Uh, and then we inhibit those muscarinic acetylcholine receptors that are at the um, autonomic uh, synapses, so to prevent those uh, dangerous drops in blood pressure. Uh, of course, ventilators can be necessary if you have respiratory paralysis. Now, a common cause of neuropathy, especially in our culture, would be diabetes. Um, 
Insulin is a very important hormone, uh, not only for regulating our blood sugar, but also for keeping neurons alive. And it's not uncommon to see neuropathy in diabetics, uh, particularly um, type 1 diabetics. Uh, over half of the adults are going to have some form of neuropathy, and about a third of type 2 uh, diabetics will have neuropathy. And the reason for this is because of the, the many functions of insulin. So one of the things that insulin does is, of course, uh, regulate glucose uptake. And a cell without glucose is a cell without energy. So whenever we have insulin insensitivity, uh, we don't properly remove glucose from the blood and take it into cells. We don't have fuel to create ATP. And if we don't make ATP, obviously neurons die. We've covered that before. That's all still true. Um, insulin also regulates our vasculature. So, of the many things that insulin does, I think there are three that are really important. Uh, one would be to increase uh, glucose uptake. And they do this by sticking glucose transporters in the membrane. So we have our transporters inside and what insulin will do is stick them in the surface. So now we have our glucose transporters or the glutes. That's what I think of when I hear glute. You probably think something different, but we stick our glutes in the uh, cell membrane and now we can take up our glucose. With glucose we can make ATP, we can keep the membrane potential uh, in an appropriate level, we don't get hyperexcitability like we see when we run out of ATP. Very much related to this uh, we can cause vasodilation. So if we're going to pick up sugar from blood, we got to get the blood into tissue. And so insulin is going to be a, 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 a vasodilation. Uh, I'm sorry, a vasodilator. And that's what these data are showing us. So um, they isolated uh, very small arteries uh, from obese and non-obese people. They treated these arteries with phenylephrine to get the idea of how much uh, can they dilate compared to at rest and then they treated them with uh, a very small dose of insulin. Um, so here we're uh, looking at looks like a hundred picomolar doses and, and you can see that in control patients we're getting about 80% uh, of the maximal contraction and that drops to maybe 55% in obese uh, subjects. So Vasodilation is going to increase blood flow into our tissues. So whenever we're insulin insensitive, not only are we not picking up glucose, but we're not getting enough blood flow. Uh, and this is important for distal areas, uh, which is likely why uh, going to contribute to this uh, glove and stocking distribution that we see for diabetic uh, neuropathies. And the final aspect here is going to be Insulin's function as a neurotrophic factor. Just like we talked about in lecture 12, uh, neurotrophic factors are going to keep neurons alive. They are going to promote uh, genes that allow for survival, that, that, uh, that remove us from that default pathway of death. And if you try to grow neurons in a dish without insulin, you'll get this. So if you look on the left there, insulin free, that's just a bunch of skin cells. So fibroblasts uh, can be grown without insulin, but not neurons. So once we discovered this in the, sometime in the 1970s, then we were able to grow neurons in culture. And if you look on the right there, they added one micromolar of insulin, so a whopping dose uh, of insulin to grow these neurons, but that's going to keep them alive. So anytime you culture neurons, you're probably looking at insulin, some form of insulin resistance because of the huge doses we have to give them. <clears throat> now, there are a few different types of uh, neuropathies that can occur with diabetes. And there's a few ways that we can get that, um, as we see here. So we can affect uh, sugar uptake, and, and really that hyperglycemia is going to lead to uh, kind of burning sensations uh, and, and pain, but it's rapidly reversible. We don't really know how it works, uh, but when there's an excess of glucose, the small fibers become hyperexcited, and that's why you feel burning pain. So those C fibers are going to be um, especially sensitive to hyperglycemia. Uh, so by uh, by taking blood sugar back into a normal range, 
we can rapidly reverse this. Um, there can also uh, be uh, sensory uh, neuropathy that occurs where primarily sensory fibers are affected um, and more commonly we're going to see polyneuropathy where a mixture of fibers are affected. Uh, in some cases it's called small fiber uh, neuropathy so this will only affect the small sensory fibers uh, that deal with pain and temperature. In the large fiber neuropathy, uh, you're going to affect, of course, those as well um, as the sensory and motor fibers that, that carry non-painful tactile sensation and also then uh, are responsible for movement. You're going to see this um, about half the cases. So you're going to have a mixture of nerve fibers that are affected, whether they're small or large diameter, whether they're somatic or autonomic. Uh, so you're just going to see a mixture of death occur. You're, it's still going to follow the, the glove and stocking pattern because those long fibers are more susceptible to death uh, just because of their larger area that they occupy and their increased metabolic burden as a result. They move more ions, they need more ATP. And we have problems getting ATP with diabetes. So the treatment uh, for diabetes is really going to be centered around controlling blood sugar levels. You don't want hyperglycemia, you don't want hypoglycemia. Both of those can be damaging to neurons. So you want to keep blood sugar in a fairly normal range. We want to ideally achieve uh, euglycemia um, as frequently as possible. Uh, when there is pain, of course painkillers are uh, a great way of controlling pain, hence the name. Controlling blood pressure is very important. So again, we're going to have issues with blood pressure control because we're insulin resistant and insulin is an important vasodilator to help regulate blood pressure. Um, so the hypertension uh, that occurs because of the inability to vasodilate needs to be controlled properly uh, to prevent further damage uh, to uh, the heart or to um, uh, nerve fibers. Um, and, and then there's... there's uh, an increased need for foot care. Uh, again, remember we have the glove and stocking distribution of neuropathies, so the ability to move and feel in the feet becomes uh, uh, impaired in diabetes. So they can, as a result of their uh, restricted um, uh, dorsiflexion there, uh, they can start to develop ulcers on their feet and because of their sensory impairments they might not notice these unless they're taking the time to properly inspect clean and care for their feet. If the ulcers form and aren't treated, that can then uh, potentially lead to infection and the need to uh, amputate. Um, the, the treatment option here is of course uh, a good daily care routine so that the feet are inspected and any wounds are identified and cared for. And then of course the use of special uh, footwear uh, can help reduce the formation of those ulcers and blisters. All right. Uh, we got a few review questions here. Have a look at those. Um, if anything's tricky, fill out the questions box or send me an email and we'll go through those over uh, our weekly question and answer session. I'll see you later.